All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Front Range Spring Series gardening webinars. Uh, we want to welcome everybody here. And our speaker today is John Mergel. So John loves plants and is tired of fixing sprinklers. <laughs> so he's going to teach us today about evidence and opinion for xeriscape practices. He received his undergraduate degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Colorado and his master's from CSU in horticulture. John, go Rams. <laughs> John, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I like to say that if I cared about football, I could root for whoever I wanted in that Rocky Mountain showdown. Um, all right, well, let's get right to it uh, because I have uh, quite a few things to get through today and I want to make sure that I have time for questions. So first, let's think about some context. Why does anybody want a zero escape in the first place? And I think that ultimately most of the reasons could be grouped into these four boxes. Aesthetic interest, hey, you just like the way it looks, it's pretty. Here's a beautiful unwatered zero escape garden, for example. And maybe you're concerned about uh, the, the environment. And you've got some ecological interest in having like a dry garden to you're watering much, or that's ecological in some way, pollinator producing. Maybe you're tired of watching water flow down the sidewalk, so that's my money that I'm watching flow down, especially as water providers um, raise rates in, in view of shortages or the extremes that we go through to bring water. Or maybe like me, you are just sick and tired of fixing the irrigation. Whatever your reason, though, it is, uh, I think, right off the bat, you will be more successful if you realize that traditional gardening principles are of little use when you are ready to get going with the zero escape. So you might have seen uh, the zero escape as a term has been around for a while, it was planned in Denver. Um, and you might have seen this somewhere the seven principles of zero escape. These are ways to get at, all right, we're, this is the special sort of things that you need to do in order to be successful xeriscaping as opposed to traditional gardening practices, which again, remember, are going to be of little use. However, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, um, what blogs you read, you'll find that traditional gardening practices tend to creep their way back into these seven principles of xeriscaping. And so what I would like to do today is to go through these seven principles um, the bold ones there are those that we'll spend the most time on. But as we go through those seven principles of Xeriscape, we're going to put them through this framework of why people want a Xeriscape. So rephrasing from the first slide, um, it's got to look good, it's got to feel good, I'm doing something for the environment, it's got to be cheap, it's got to be easy, I'm tired of fixing the irrigation. Those are the filter that we're going to run through the framework of the seven principles of Xeriscape. Um, today and explore uh, what practices you often see recommended and whether or not they may or may not be worth the effort or time that we need. So first off, first principle of zero escape is that you should plan. And I absolutely agree with this and I have little more to say about good planning. Good planning makes for good gardens, but I do have a little bit to say in trying to frame the context of why we're zero escaping. And if xeriscaping is really ultimately about sustainability, if it's about using less water, if it's about using less fertilizer, if it's about low maintenance gardening, if all of those are your goal, then matching plants to your site conditions, rather than trying to match your site conditions to the plants you want to grow, whether you're going to be watering them or amending the soil or whatever, is philosophically and practically the best possible option. Match the plants to the place, um, and the way you're going to do that is, of course, by site analysis. So one of the things that has to be involved with planning is not just getting out your graph paper and your colored pencils, but it is really understanding the location where you're going to be gardening. And that includes textural and chemical soil analyses. Send that soil test off for an evaluation. Uh, it's understanding how water flows across the property or the gardening site, uh, understanding things like what aspect or exposure it has, and then importantly, one that is uh, honestly the most important, in my opinion, is what are the landscape objectives? What is this place supposed to be doing? Are you planning to eat picnics there? Do you look at it from the kitchen window or do you never see it and you just want uh, something that meets your HOA's landscaping code, but that you don't really have to think about? Knowing your objective is going to help 
um, understand what the options are combined with these other um, with these other items here to be as successful as possible. So don't forget those when you're planning. But that's all about planning. Um, so let's move on to principle number two, and one that we'll spend a bit more time on. So xeriscaping principle number two is improve the soil. And these are things that you can pull uh, Google, Google search. Uh, you can find these on gardening blogs. I do them in the office. And these are all things that I've heard um, within the past year or so, so or read. Amend the soil with organic matter to improve water retention. Amend the soil with organic matter to improve drainage. Interesting contrast there. Mix rock, sand, or gravel into the soil to promote drainage. Or adding rocks or gravel will help keep the soil lean for native plants. So let's explore these. First, let's talk about organic matter and amending with organic matter. This is one, um, this is like almost everybody knows to do this. They say, oh, I'm going to plant plants. I need to amend with organic matter. So much so that perhaps it's getting overdone. And I would actually amend that to say so much so that this is getting overdone. No perhaps about it. So what is organic matter doing in the soil? Well, organic matter is an important source of soil glue, if you will, that's keeping the individual soil particles that are part of soil texture, that is uh, grains of sand, silt, or clay, stuck together into larger components called heads. So as you see here in this graphic, you've got individual particles and they're kind of in loose globs together. And it's organic matter that's holding them together that's ultimately creating that pore space where roots want to grow and where water and air can be and where soil microbial activity can be. Organic matter gets into the soil um, in a number of ways. One, plants directly load organic matter into the soil, believe it or not, with root exudates. You've got microbes and fungi, of course, living their entire lives in the soil. So their remains and their metabolic byproducts are there as organic matter in the soil. Then you've got dead things decomposing from their life. Then you've got soil amendments. You might add manure, compost, uh, wooden paper, whatever. And we come to this idea, I think, of, oh, soil organic matter is good. I'm building the soil. There's a lot in the news right now. Like No-till farming. We're going to add organic matter. Um, but you can have too much of a good thing. And too much of a good thing in organic matter comes in the amount of organic matter. So this is a picture of a peat bog, and I'm curious if anybody knows, there's no way for you to tell me right now, what is the minimum amount of organic matter according to the USGS that you need in order to qualify as a peat bog? The answer might surprise you, it's 20% organic matter, and then you're a peat bog. How many people, and I am guilty of this 100%, have thought, I'm planting a garden. I should get that planter's meat. That is a mix of topsoil that has organic matter in it. And then they add 40% of compost to it. So you're looking at something that is well within in that purchased soil, planters mix, gardeners mix, whatever they call it. That could classify as peat bog. That is bananas to me. And that is not the way you want to go if you're trying to grow a zero state. It's just too much organic matter. What is the ideal amount of organic matter? Well, it turns out in most natural soils, organic matter is three to five percent. You see here. Uh, schematic of what could be in soil. You've got the mineral component that is the parent rock. And then you have air and water in the pore spaces, just as important as the mineral component if you want life to occur in that soil. And then this small slice of the pie that is organic matter. That organic matter is made up, as you can see, of some things that are actively decomposing, uh, things that take longer, living organisms. And that organic matter is influencing your soil structure. It's how the soil is put together and influencing whether or not roots can proliferate deeply or shallowly, how quickly water might move through the soil. Whereas your texture, clay, sand, or silt, um, is not something you can change very easily without bringing in dump trucks of either amendment or new soil to try to change, oh, I don't like my clay soil. No amount of organic matter is going to change your clay soil. It might change the way your clay soil is structured, but you will always have clay. And too much organic matter, again, can be a real issue. So here's a thought experiment. What herbicide was used here? This is a planting medium uh, near, near uh, our office in our county here. This is in Lone Tree. And this picture was taken at the end of September. And this site was prepared for planting the previous spring in May, almost a year ago. Um, this site was prepared, and this picture I took in late September. What herbicide was used here? This grew a whole summer, not a thing grew in there. 
And the answer is organic matter. This was a planter's mix. It was already 40% compost. And then they amended the planter's mix with additional compost. So on September 29th, there was one plant growing, uh, clinging to life in the shade of this water meter um, that germinated. But otherwise, that organic matter by um, interrupting water relations, perhaps, there could be a number of ways that it affected it, but too much organic matter made a real problem for plant growth in this growing medium that you can see here. No plants for it. It's a great pre-emergent. So what do you do if you're in the three to five percent range of organic matter in your soil, um, but you still want, you're still ready to plant, you still have something to mitigate in terms of compaction? Well, you want to loosen and lift your soil, but don't add more compost, sawdust, whatever organic amendment. You don't need it. You're just trying to build those pore spaces. Let the plants do the work. Again, plants are part of this um, natural web of the ecosystem that are going to be putting those natural root exudates into the soil that are going to help increase its organic matter over time and get it to the next balance level. And then remember, and this is most important, don't sacrifice your soil, your soil structure, those heads, the pumps that are allowing the pore space for water and, and oxygen, air. Don't sacrifice that structure for the sake of feeling productive. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that say, well, I just, it feels so good to get that compost in there. I'm like, yes, yes, it does. But take a step back and recognize your feeling of productivity is um, going to be hampered later in the summer, maybe when your garden doesn't turn out like you wanted it to. And also maybe uh, not worth the damage you do to your soil structure. So organic amendments, um, may not be the best thing for your estate. You might need an organic amendment, but it's important to remember, don't overdo an organic amendment. Well, let's look at inorganic amendments, because that's another thing that you hear, especially for zero estates. Again, we're gonna mix in sand, rock, or gravel to improve drainage, and then we're gonna add rocks or gravel to help keep the soil lean from native plants. All right, well, what does gravel do when it's mixed into a soil? And here's a list of things we're going to explore them and unpack them a bit. But these are all of the things that there are records, uh, scientific studies showing this is, what, this is what gravel and soil does. It does improve resistance to compaction. Great. Uh, it increases runoff in general. Uh, it changes the fine soil properties. This is, um, this is a fun effect, but if you think uh, it's in the graphic, we've got some particles of rock that are taking up the space that roots and life and ecological processes would be taking if that were all soil, then the life is concentrated into a smaller area. And so you can actually see um, some pretty marked changes or improvements, if you will, to the soil that's in the fine soil in these spaces between the larger rock particles. Um, the effects of gravel, of course, vary by plant and climate. So it doesn't in ecology, it always depends. Um, and then two points that I'll um, get into both now and then when we talk about mulch. Um, but gravel in the soil will reduce plant productivity by restricting the rooting space available for plants and by elevating soil temperatures. On the contrary, though, uh, gravel and rocks in soil will increase plant productivity because they resist compaction, as we said. They can improve water infiltration and um, they can elevate soil temperatures. So you have their elevated soil temperatures uh, on both sides of the coin, um, a matter of degree, as we're seeing. So let's talk about compaction first. Adding rocks, mixing rocks into your soil can definitely help with compaction if you put enough rocks in. And the idea here, which was really um, pioneered and commercialized by Cornell University, that if you have enough inorganic matter, if you have enough rocks, they make a framework or a structure. Those rocks can touch one another and the fine soil between them is then protected from compaction because the rocks can't compact. So you're building this lattice of a rock that then the fine soil is fine. Then. But the critical factor, as I said, is that you have to have enough rocks in the soil to make that work. The rocks are so far apart that they can't touch, and obviously you can still compact. So, whoops, I'm sorry about that. In another study, they showed that gravel improved resistance to compaction at 20% by volume. So the Cornell folks said you got to have 60% rocks or more by volume in order to build that framework. Another study said, no, 20% by volume, we still saw improvement, increasing improvement though, up to a maximum of 40%, which is what they tested here. 
So it's not to say that you need 60% rocks by volume to see benefit. That is a ton of rock, millions of rocks, several tons of rocks. Um, some amount can help even at um, lower percentages, but you do need to have enough rock to set up that frame. Some of it's going to depend on what kind of rocks you're using, ultimately how much rock by volume that turns out to be. All right, the other thing we hear about rocks doing mixed into the soil, in addition to resisting compaction, so I'm increasing the drainage. If I mix rocks into the soil, drainage is improved. And is that actually true? And I think that there's a question mark around that. Is it true or not? Situationally, um, it may not be particularly true. So, for example, desert pavements, which is when you have rocks mixed into the soil and then rocks across the top of the soil, sheds water. And the same uh, idea here, you can think of trying to crowd into um, a subway car or something versus just walking through an open field. If you have limited openings, uh, then water only has limited roots to go in. So if you have rocks mixed into the soil, there's only so many roots that the water can take to infiltrate the soil. So if you have water that's falling quickly, a lot of it's just gonna run off because it can't get into those pore spaces. Um, and you can see as soon as you add gravel soil above in this study, as soon as you add gravel in the soil about 15% by weight, um, it started to significantly reduce water availability. Um, here you can see a figure from this 2020 study that compared no gravel or bare soil, gravel embedded or gravel mixed into soil with gravel mulch on the far right in terms of surface runoff subsurface flow and infiltration in a rain event. 60 millimeters of an hour of rain, that's two and a half inches of rain an hour. That is our most intense summer thunderstorm. That's a lot of rain. You can see on these slopes, 10 degrees, 15, 20, and 25 degrees, how the gravel embedded into the soil in that middle column affected runoff. And it was either the same as or worse than bare soil. So particularly on that slope, um, as we increase the slope, you can see if gravel was mixed into the soil, water was just running off of that and not infiltrating, more so than if you just hadn't had any um, gravel mixed in at all. But also notice, and we'll come back to this later, that gravel mulch seems to infiltrate a lot of water in those heavy rain events, certainly more so than the embedded gravel or the gravel mixed in. So the takeaway here, well, yes, embedded gravel is keeping things drier in the rooting zone, but the reason that it's keeping things drier may not be because of drainage. It may be that it's causing water to run off and not infiltrate the soil. Now, in areas with three spot cycles, like Denver, for example, or anywhere along the front range, gravel on the soil can eventually improve drainage because during those three spot cycles, eventually you get separation between the fine soil and the gravel particle. And that presents not only a route, but a super highway for water to flow down in those cracks between rocks and the fine soil particles. Similar to compaction though, if you don't have enough rocks for those things to be connected, for those channels to be connected, you won't have an improvement in your drainage or infiltration of water. So if you're going to be mixing in rocks, you would need to mix in a lot of rocks. In fact, you can see in clay soils, if you only introduce 20 to 30% by volume, um, you actually decrease drainage. Once you get above that threshold, drainage increases. And what have you done there? You've set up that framework. So let's take a step back though and consider why is it that we want to increase drainage? Why did we say we want to increase drainage in the first place? And we said, oh, because we want our native plants to be happy, right? We think we need to improve drainage so that the plants don't sit in a bathtub or a swamp. Well, there was a study that was looking at actually uh, nuclear waste buried deep and how to keep water out of it. And they found that mixing in gravel into the soil, um, as you can see, evolved from two levels, um, had no effect on the water content of the soil when plants were there because plants removed the water regardless. The plants are taking the water out of the soil. Plants weren't there. You did actually perch the water right at the bottom of that gravel layer. Um, so this study, again, trying to keep water out of nuclear waste sites, like you should mix gravel in on the off chance 
that plants aren't growing there, there's a good chance the water is going to stop. So that is the opposite of drainage. Um, but again, if plants are there, it's irrelevant. But in the same study, if they mulched the surface of the ground with 15 centimeters of gravel, um, they had a huge amounts of soil water storage and surface drainage, regardless if plants were there or not. So again, more weight to this idea that gravel on the surface of mulch rather than mixed in gets a lot more water into the soil and drains it better than gravel mixed in. Gravel mixed in can keep things dry if it creates runoff. Um, but gravel mulch may be ultimately better for plants growing in xeriscapes. That's tied in with this idea of soil leaning. Do we need to make the soil somehow less productive for native plants to really thrive? And as I alluded to earlier, there are some contradictory effects of rocks. Um, with adequate moisture, rocky soil definitely decreases plant productivity. There's just less space for plants to um, exploit resources. And this is particularly true with crops that are used to heavy resource use. But in dry conditions, rocky soil actually increases productivity. Why is that? Well, um, there may be some of those temperature effects, but ultimately I think it all has to come down to water. So in this picture here, you can see this is a super bloom. Um, this is not this year, but I hear we're having one this year, but it's just charming. Um, and I will ask you, what is causing the desert to bloom? Back? Did somebody go out there and fertilize? Or did they get enough water? And so this idea of leaning and drainage, I think we get um, ahead of ourselves in a way and say, well, all right, I just want to get all the water away. When in reality, if you're looking to use as little water as possible, maximizing that soil infiltration and charge into the soil column will give you the most benefit for your dry plants. So much so that you could even go to an unwatered situation with many plants in the right place because you are infiltrating enough water um, with gravel and mulch, for example, to provide those plants their needs. So again, what's the limiting factor to these things? It's not that the soil is too rich. It's not that the soil is not rich enough. It's that they got some water, so then they went crazy. So is mixing in gravel worth the effort? And this is a question for you to answer for yourself situationally. Um, will it keep plant crowns dry and prevent root suffocation in waterlogged soils? I think that's questionable. This is, I think, probably the number one reason people say that they're going to mix gravel in is that, oh, I need drainage better to keep the plant crowns dry. Uh, I want the soil not to be dry. And what we've seen is that, well, plant crowns are going to be dry because maybe water is running off. And if plants are there, gravel is kind of irrelevant to the water level, but without plants, kind of stack the water up. So that one's questionable for me. Does it reduce soil productivity? I mean, yes, but is that a problem in a xeriscape? Um, you could reduce soil productivity in a xeriscape by watering less. That is the whole idea of the xeriscape, but that's the limiting factor here. It's not that, oh, I can't grow a xeriscape because my soil is too rich. That's, that's not a thing in our part of the country. And then can it mitigate compaction? This, in my opinion, is the one most compelling reason that you might want to mix gravel into your soil or some other rock into your soil. Because if you can get enough, again, to set up that framework, rock touching rock, you can prevent your soil from being compacted. So if this is an area like a road median next to a busy sidewalk, those might be things to consider to prevent that compaction from happening in the first place um, in your garden. But again, is mixing and gravel worth the effort? That is up to you, but I will leave you with these thoughts about soil amendments, whether organic or inorganic, and that is a prescription should give you pause. And so if you are hearing like, oh, anytime you plant a garden, mix in four inches of compost, or anytime you're planting a garden with uh, native or xeric plants, you should mix in six inches of squeegee or sand or pea gravel or whatever rock material, you should pause and think, does that really make sense? Because as, as we all know, the world is not uniform. Gardens are not uniform. Uh, sites are not uniform. So uniform prescription should be a red flag. Always, really always? Site analysis, again, should inform your landscape practice. If you understand your site, you will understand what modifications you might need to take in order to better be able to grow plants in that site. So going back again, put the right plant in the right place. 
And if you should find yourself poised on the precipice of being your own personal glacier, something is going to create a landscape modification on a geologic scale, you should probably just consider growing different plants than forcing this change, which is going to be time and labor and financial resource intensive to grow that plant palette, unless you have a super compelling reason that I need this plant. Um, and I think most folks just want a nice landscape and aren't committed to, uh, if I can't grow you know, this one thing that I'm gonna need to, uh, if I can't grow blueberries, for example, and I have to put in bale after bale of heat moss and then add humidifiers um, to keep the blueberries happy, most of us, I think, just want nice yards. So remember, put the right plant in the right place. John? Yeah. Before you go on, I just have one question that came in. Um, and the person said, I heard that adding rocks and gravel to clay just makes concrete. Is there any reason not to add rocks? You talked about why to add rocks, maybe why not to, but I think they're more specifically, they've heard that adding sand to clay soils makes concrete. Do you want to just touch on that briefly? Sure. So, um, I have never personally made concrete out of my soil, but it is definitely a potential. If you get the ratios of those particle sizes just right, you can turn things really nasty really quickly with subsequent working. Uh, and like, oh, well, walking with compaction. Um, but this is the principle behind Adobe Brick, right? This, this stuff is the right percentages of sand, silk, and clay together that it can harden into something really useful for construction if you pack it down right with the right water. So mixing sand into clay is certainly not a guarantee like, oh no, now I've made concrete. But yeah, if you've got the right percentages and then you apply the right treatments, that is the right moisture level, right compaction, you can do some pretty nasty things to your soil. So that's again why, um, I mean, not only making concrete, but if you over amend with compost, you could end up with phosphorus toxicity. So there are all sorts of consequences for amending without the purpose for your amendment in mind. And I think I would encourage everyone here, if you haven't already um, gotten past the idea of I have to amend with something in order to feel like a productive gardener, do what you can do to get past that mindset and have an objective. I am amending in order to improve or fix this one problem rather than I'm gardening, therefore I'm amending the soil, which is not necessarily uh, logical or needed. All right, anything else before I go on? Carry on, thank you. Thank you. All right, principle number three, use efficient irrigation. This is again obvious, yes, you should use efficient irrigation. One thing you'll hear though, is that drip irrigation is best for zero space. Is that true or not? Let's find out. So again, let's take one step back and ask ourselves a question. Why are we watering plants? Well, uh, the reason is that in nature, we have two competing ways that we've got water coming into the soil and leaving the soil. We have precipitation, here represented by the dark green line, and then you have EET, or evaporate, evapotranspiration. That is the combination of soil lost, uh, excuse me, the combination of water lost from the soil surface and from plants as they pull the water through their body to use it for metabolic processes, growth, and cooling. And you can get a water deficit at certain times of year, especially here. This area here, you can see that evapotranspiration in the summertime in Colorado exceeds what we usually receive from precipitation. So in order to allow plants to survive in a time like this, we say, all right, well, we're gonna make up for that precipitation. So that's why we're watering and know that Plants um, don't just need water um, like we do in the a drink of water, but they can access water from the, that's stored in the soil from their roots, or they access water that's stored in their bodies to make up that deficit in nature. That's how plants can live right without it being always raining, because they have these ways of extracting the water that's stored in the landscape. And know that overwatering is definitely a thing. Um, you can see some cattails as a landscape we need. So we like to water our landscapes here in Colorado. I'm going to suggest that maybe we could take one step back from having cat tails as landscape leaves. And drip irrigation could be a great way to do that. Um, but remember, 
how drip irrigation works, what it was designed for, and then how you might translate that to a landscape. So drip irrigation was pioneered in Israel for agriculture in the desert. Um, when you say we live in a high desert, yes, we do not live in the Negev though, which is much drier, as you can see here in the picture. It was designed to precisely replace the evapotranspiration from plants growing yards. So very precisely measured this pomegranate, this date palm, use this much water, therefore we will drip exactly that much water for that plant for the next day in this setting so that it has just enough water to complete what it needs to do, and we're not over water. Similar to landscape fabric, we've got now a translation of an agricultural product into landscape use, into perennial crops. And so what this means is that you need to reconsider your run times and your frequency. So in this schematic, you can see here, uh, drip emitter, if you were running it on the right on a daily fashion, okay, I've got my, my one gallon per hour emitter, I'm gonna run 15 minutes twice a week. Well, you're just wetting this small area around the point. You remember, drip irrigation is designed to wet this one area where the plant's going to proliferate roots. We don't want the plant wasting water, growing all these roots it doesn't need. And then I'm going to water it right there. And let it always know, here's your water. And for many people, I think in a zero escape, you want the plant to live by itself, right? I think the goal for many of us is not to always run the irrigation. We don't have a yield goal. We, have, we want a landscape that looks nice and we want to save money. In that case, you need to encourage that plant um, to explore and then take advantage of as big a rooting area as possible. There in the left, you can see where my new plant has been planted. I want to soak that entire potential rooting area so the plant can then exploit it for resources and for stored water especially. So can you do that with a drip emitter? Yeah, you absolutely can. You just need to get water onto the plant. But what that means if you're using drip irrigation, if you want to get away from having to use that irrigation system to keep your plants alive, is that you need to reconsider your run times and your run frequency in order to let that large of an area instead of the small area. So again, it's like, oh, it's a one gallon per hour emitter. Well, depending on your soil and how large plants are and um, how deep you need to get that water, you could be running that emitter much longer than you are now. You find, oh, it's run for 15 minutes. And well, great, run it for an hour or overnight, a long time. And the only way to know exactly how long you need to run it is to check the soil and see how deep am I moistening the soil? Am I getting it wet where this plant can exploit it? And of course you wanna do that as infrequently as you possibly can for the plant to tolerate. Because the idea with this irrigation is to support the plant when it needs the extra water, but not to overwater or not to water for the sake of watering. Because that is the mindset going to water because I have a garden, watering it is what one does. That is how you get cattails growing as a landscape weed. So ask yourself, do I even need this irrigation? My answer is no. Again, tired of fixing it. What are the site parameters? Um, what are your landscape objectives? Do I need sprinklers? Do I need drip emitters at all? Is this just, oh yeah, this is boilerplate on a landscape contract. I'll put in your drip emitters and you run them 15 minutes twice a week. Consider that, what am I using this for? Do I need it just while the plants establish? Am I growing things that are likely to need supplemental irrigation for the rest of their lives, vegetables, fruit trees? Um, and then consider repair and maintenance. Is this worth your time and energy? Consider plant growth and how that's gonna change your irrigation needs. Another way you see plants die is, oh, I never adjusted the irrigation after the plant started to grow. But again, I encourage you to think about do you need irrigation long term? Because there are plenty of plants that will grow just fine once you establish them um, using stored water in the soil or in their bodies to fulfill that gap between precipitation and evapotranspiration rather than needing us to say, oh, here's your water for the Now you might object to me and say, but without an irrigation system, my plants will just not make nice. And I'm here to prove to you today that an irrigation system is no guarantee of garden success. It's evidence by these myriad examples of irrigated gardens, many of which you can see the irrigation proudly sitting above grade. Um, aren't these beautiful? All irrigated. So irrigation, again, not the key for success. All right, principle number four, use drought tolerant plants. It's again, well done. Um, but you'll hear things like plants that are native to Northern Colorado are naturally more drought tolerant, more resistant to pests and disease. Uh, they're generally healthier since they're growing in their native environment. 
that zero escape plants are native, should only plant natives. In common that comes up, the native plants are trending and popular right now. And I think that really what we're facing when we talk about native plants in many cases, is an issue of scale. Plants don't grow in Colorado. They don't grow um, here, as you can see on the right, in the high plains ecoregion, as defined by the EPA. Plants grow in a plot of habitat that is roughly the size of, a, of, of the plant. So when you are considering growing plants and picking natives, they will native to where? Native to what sort of habitat? For example, these plants are all growing happily at the Denver Zoo. They're not in Colorado, they're not in Denver, they're even at the zoo. They are right where they are. And it's the site conditions where that plant is that are really determining its success or failure. So you might've seen examples like this before, but here are some native plants, the front range of Colorado. And I say none of these plants, 0% of them would perform well in a zero scape because this is not a xeric native environment. This is the poster child of native plant disaster in a garden. Aspen trees in Denver, unless you've got a really special spot and you water them, they're not gonna look great. The native plants of the front range. Here are some plants that are not native to the front range of Colorado and that do gloriously in the front range of Colorado in gardens, especially with minimal or no water at all. So again, consider um, what exactly you mean by native and consider what scale is being discussed when you're thinking about planting natives or not. And of course, I'm talking about water use. There are plenty of other arguments, like pollinators and other things that we can talk about. Um, but I'm just talking about zero state and water. So in general, if a native is gonna grow on your site, by all means, plant a native plant. You should, I don't want to come off the saying from like, you don't need to plant native plants. Plant native plants, they're awesome. And if you are taking a strong position about planting native plants or planting not native plants, please be ready to justify it. I will tell you this, the issue is so complicated that you can justify nearly any stance on this issue with science. You can find some peer-reviewed studies out there that will seem to back up your argument, no matter what argument you're trying to make. You might need to get a degree in philosophy in order to successfully discuss this. Um, and then always remember, as one of my professors at CU used to say, ecology is not rocket science, it's part of it. And so trying to tease out all of the possible interactions between native plants and food web and the wider ecosystem is not as easy as saying, oh yeah, well, it's native, so obviously it's better. Um, in a garden setting, in an urban or suburban environment, that may or may not be. One thing that is important to remember when you're choosing plants for your landscape to be successful with those landscaping goals is to understand and remember how plants cope with drought because the plant strategy for coping with drought is not gonna be irrelevant to your landscaping. Um, so here's got an example uh, from right to left. Crocus, they just say, when it's dry, we're out of here. You're not gonna see us. Clearly, you wouldn't want to choose all plants that chose that strategy for your zero escape, or they'd only look good for a week of the year and then the rest of the time it would just be dirt. You have leaf modifications in the salvia and the thyme there. Uh, and you have succulents in the form of the agave, the lots of stored water in the body. Then you have defense, like the acacia there with those big thorns, um, ready to say, don't take my water or I will stab you. That would not be something you'd want to landscape with. My traffic areas or playgrounds, for example, the agave has got the combination of spines and succulents. But remember that the plant strategy for drought tolerance is not irrelevant to your landscaping choices. And that goes back to planning, putting the right plant in the right place. Okay, principle five, mulch. You should use organic mulches like bark, full peelings, or wood grindings to minimize surface water evaporation and reduce weed growth. And inorganic mulches include rocks and gravel and should be applied at least two feet. Great, let's, let's talk about mulch, whether it's organic or inorganic. What is mulch? You can tell by now I like to take a step back and say, whoa, 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 let's define some things and put ourselves in context. Context. So something that allows water do it through it going down, but ideally not evaporating back up. That's good mulch. We don't want weeds to grow. And we want to cover the soil and we want to protect the plant roots from temperature streams or bunny rabbits or whatever. They're all things that mulch can do. Um, and I think in our psyche and certainly in English language, as you can see here, we are... Uh, primed to think of mulch as organic materials. And in a zero escape, I think that we will um, hopefully start considering inorganic mulches as, as often as we consider organic ones. 
So mulch has been documented out the wazoo, up and down, organic or inorganic, mulch is good. You should be using mulch. But you should understand what your mulch does and how it behaves in the landscape. So without question, wood mulch reduces evaporation from the soil. How is wood mulch with infiltration? So when it rains, um, wood mulch is going to absorb some amount of precipitation. More importantly though, wood mulch can become hydrophobic in places that are hot and dry, like the Front Range in much of Colorado or much of the West for that matter. And you will find things happening like you can see on the right, um, local uh, organic particle board being made is that mulch is heated, it pyrolyzes, it gets colonized by fungi, like you can see here. There is no rainwater that is getting through this mulch. There's no water from your overhead sprayer sprinklers getting through this mulch. Unless your drip emitter is under the mulch, there's no water from your drip emitter that's getting through this mulch. So if you're using organic mulch, you need to be making sure that it's being disturbed regularly, or if you're checking plant, make sure that it's breaking down and not becoming an impenetrable sheet. Um, the other thing that can happen to mulch, in addition to absorbing water, can become hydrophobic um, in its own right without the fungi. This is a little video that I took after last May. We had two inches, no, we had an inch of rain in Castle Rock over two days. Nice slow rain, inch of rain. I was so excited. And then I found that all of my plants needed watering, like the day after it rained. So I went out there to see, see, see here that the top eighth of an inch of that mulch is wet. Again, an inch of rain over two days, and I stopped. The soil beneath it is just complete powder. Um, see the hose there that I had to drag out the water and everything. Else. So understand that wood mulch is not great when it comes to infiltration. If it's in a hot, dry environment, like Colorado, in the shade, if it's being, there are ways to get around this, but you need to understand that wood mulch will do this in order to successfully use it. Uh, here's an example of how much water different mulches can uh, accumulate. OGC in this table, this is from this study from 2005, not from my extension colleagues in California. OGC, you see right here, this was uh, a brand name of the mulch company they used, but it was a mix of wood chips and bark. And you can see that of an inch of water that was applied um, per foot of mulch, there was supposed to be a lot of mulch, but it would capture a third of an inch of the water. A third of it was being captured and just absorbed by the mulch. That wasn't counting runoff, they didn't have runoff in the situation. See, rock, uh, obviously much less water and grow into the rock. Makes sense. So speaking of rocks, Without question, gravel mulch reduces evaporation from the soil, just like wood mulch. They both work. But what about infiltration here? This is where I'll just remind you of the charts we looked at earlier. Um, you can see with gravel mulching, how much water, more than embedded gravel for bare soil in this case, gravel mulch, it's like twice as much water getting into the soil. An even more dramatic example of this was actually determined uh, in the 60s by researchers at CSU up at the Agriculture Experiment Station where they found that over a precipitation year, we had about 24 inches of rain total. When a site was mulched with gravel five centimeters deep, just a couple inches of gravel, almost all of that rainfall, you can see up here, almost all of it infiltrated into the soil. It accumulated into the breeding zone where plants could use it. Bare soil, less than five inches of the 24 measured inches of precipitation actually got into the soil. You see, we need one centimeter deep of gravel, which is basically a layer of gravel, one rock thick, doubled the amount of water that actually got into the soil. These same researchers said uh, several years later, um, almost 30 years after these experiments, they're still thinking about it, that in a rainfall event of three inches per hour, which is, again, a humongous amount of rain, four inches of gravel mulch will, quote, effectively eliminate the run. That is amazing if you're trying to grow a dry garden or a zero state because if that water is infiltrated into the soil your plants can access it and use it another consideration about mulch uh, quickly is temperature so you will probably have heard or know that rock mulch is, is behind urban heat island right and rock mulch does really effectively transfer heat to the underlying soil so that means that then at night, for example, after the sun goes down, that soil can re-radiate all of that heat into the, into the environment to keep things warm. 
Wood mulch doesn't do that. It doesn't transfer heat to the soil very well. That actually means that it goes, that it gets really, really hot during the day, actually much hotter than the surface of the rocks. Here you can see from a 2008 study, you've got wood mulch, composted pine residue, decomposed granite and bare soil. How quickly, 10 in the morning, um, the wood mulch and the composted pine residue already up there in the like 130 degree range um, of surface temperature. You can see the bare soil on the rocks were much slower to, to heat up, never got as hot, but then do cool down um, more slowly. The results were even more dramatic. Um, that first table was actually done in Phoenix. Um, this was from Salt Lake City though, and the results were even more dramatic. You can see, my goodness, how hot we're getting. That is uh, centigrade up there, um, I don't know, 67 degrees centigrade. That is hot. Um, it's like 120 degrees is hot enough to kill most things in the dryer. This temperature is 145 degrees. We're well above. I mean, that's that's safe heat temperature for steak, right? That might even be medium well. I'm sure you don't even steak. But anyway, um, the point is, know what your mulch does. And wood mulch on the surface gets super hot. So if you've got wood mulch with plants planted in a sea of wood mulch, those plants are exposed to some really hot temperatures where the mulch reaches their crowns or if the leaf were to break across the mulch. Planting more densely can help mitigate that. Now, those rocks transferring heat to the soil, bad thing in Phoenix for urban heat island, maybe not such a bad thing further north, though. And in fact, there are some studies, uh, one particularly out of Germany that you see here, that showed that gravel mulch increased underground biomass and bioactivity in the shoulder seasons of spring and fall. Essentially, warming up the soil helped perennials grow because they had a longer growing season. Also, um, increased water infiltration from snow melt. melts the snow and the water goes in. This is something that indigenous per, uh, indigenous people in the Four Corners area have known about for over a thousand years. And they're archaeological sites where they have agricultural fields that were deliberately mulched with gravel in order to improve this water infiltration. Now, are all rocks mulch? No, and resoundingly no. Rocks are not mulch. Gravel is mulch. So if the rocks are too big, Plants can't grow in them at all for a number of reasons, but the effectiveness of gravel mulch for evaporation reduction is gets less and less as the particle size gets bigger. That is to say, bigger rocks don't prevent evaporation from the soil very well. Smaller rocks do a better job. What's going on there? Well, in this little schematic, you can see bigger rocks. You have water moving up through the soil by capillary action. I have no idea why I decided to make that yellow. Doesn't make sense. Um, water moving through the soil by capillary action and then evaporating from the soil at a very high rate because wind eddies are able to form in those rocks. And that actually increases the turbulence over even what you might see if there were no rocks at all. On the other end of the spectrum, if your rocks are too small, say if you use fine sand as mulch, then the pore space between what's in the native soil and in the sand is not different enough to prevent uh, laminar flow and capillary action of water straight through the mulch. So it's it's essentially no mulch at all in this situation. The Goldilocks zone is when you have uh, capillary action to rocks that are no larger than about half an inch in individual rock diameter, gravel size. Um, then you have pore spaces that are different enough from the underlying soil and closed enough pore spaces that you don't get wind eddies, that you really minimize the amount of evaporation through that layer of rock. Um, so the water comes up to the surface, but can't get farther, and all of the water stays in the transport exploit. So in summary, mulch. Use mulch. You absolutely should be using mulch, whether it's wood chips or whether it's gravel, but use mulch. Rocks are not mulch. Gravel is mulch. And know what different types of mulch you use. So we say put the right plant in the right place. We say put the right plant with the right mulch. All right, principle number six. Whoops, reduce your turf use. Reducing turf use is the best way to save water in landscaping. Think on the surface, yeah, it's a good way to reduce water use in landscaping if you're overwatering your turf or if it's uh, turf that you otherwise wouldn't use and you just water and keep it green. But again, consider your site and the practical application. Is this landscape, by reducing its turf in the way that they have, reducing their water? Maybe not. Right now, they've got their soil, they've damaged their trees, they're signing up for a landscape project. This might not have been the most efficient way to save water in their landscape. 
maybe we should go artificial turf, roll out the green carpeting. Um, I would I would encourage you not to do this for a number of reasons. Number one, it gets super hot. It smells like hot plastic when it is hot. Sheds microplastics into the environment. In other words, it pollutes water. Um, and you still have to water it. Oh my goodness, this I had never considered, but this was, oh my goodness. Um, you still have to clean it, uh, especially if pets, not self-cleaning like natural turf grasses. And it gets so hot that in order to use it in the summertime, you have to water it to cool it down. And then also remember, it's not around forever. Um, you've got to either recycle the stuff with luck or it has to go into the landfill and clean the plastic. So if you're considering artificial turf, not saying that it's universally bad, maybe I am saying that, but you might have a really good reason to use artificial turf, but I would encourage you, please make sure it is a really good reason before you decide to do this. Like you're inside the pasture of it or something like that would be a great reason. All right, principle number seven, direct maintenance. Maintaining a zero escape is different than maintaining a lawn. I'm like, is it though in many ways? Yes, it is obviously, but at a larger level, it's not. Because if you give plants what they need to grow, when they want it to grow, they will grow. In fact, we've been more with the zero escape, maintaining it. It's not that different after. Just a couple notes about maintenance. Um, one, if you use herbicides, know that they can behave differently in zero escapes. Um, especially breakdown and persistence can be markedly um, longer in dry areas without a lot of water. Um, and then also remember that many herbicides require weeds to be actively growing in order to be effective. So if the plants, if the weeds that you're trying to fight uses drought, style, uh, drought strategies to stop growing, your herbicide is going to be open. So this is another example of just be informed about the plants you're dealing with, about your situation, about the chemical you might be trying to use to be most successful. Understand your garden in particular situation. And then recognize that adjustments with your water is going to be needed. Long-term watering. Uh, hey, we water these zero escapes to establish them, but if we don't ever stop watering them, then what was the point of going to the zero escape? It doesn't make sense. This situation of the cutter and partner, like, why did we do this? It doesn't make sense in terms of water savings. And one final note about established trees. Um, don't kill your trees by accident if you try to convert to a zero state. How much water do trees need each day? Is it 50 gallons, 250 gallons, so 10 inches of per uh, inch of trunk diameter per week? The answer is nobody really knows, unfortunately, but it is situational. And it depends on two things primarily, well, three things. Number one, it depends on the type of the tree. Depends on how much soil area that tree can exploit. Because remember, where is the tree getting its water? It's getting it from water that's stored in its body or in the soil. So if it has more soil or stored water, it might need less supplemental water than its natal that's been in a, uh, a medium or something that's limited in weed space. And then of course, how much water can that soil that the tree can exploit for? The other consideration. Also remember that a plant optimum, not the same as its tolerance. So it might be the case that your catalpa would love all the water you can give it. It's also the case that it could tolerate very low water indeed and still be a happy, healthy tree with minimal problems. So um, in conclusion, if I were to say one thing about the whole talk, summarize the talk in a sentence, it's know the situation of your garden and know what problems you're trying to solve before you start applying to it. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. And I'll have any other questions. Thanks, John. That was really great. Lots of good information there. Um, I'm going to turn to our panelists and see if they have any questions that they found in the Q&A that they want to ask live. Uh, panelists, go ahead and jump on um, and let us know. Uh, yes. So we have one question about best practices for fall and spring maintenance for a seriescape garden. Do you have any advice? for a person that just started doing this? Sure, so um, it depends. The best, the most fun ecological answer, it depends. Um, if you are concerned about uh, environmental impacts on invertebrates or pollinators, then spring is by far a better time. It has to be later in spring than you might imagine. If you, oh, I didn't come back in September and I'm cleaning everything up now, well, then you might as well have cleaned up in September because everything is still overwintering at this point. You can wait till later in the spring. That's when things start to emerge. Um, remember that even small amounts 
help a lot for tiny creatures. So it doesn't mean that you have to leave your whole yard unkempt if that's not workable for you. If you just can't take it, if the HOA is writing you angry letter after angry letter, set aside areas where you say, this is where I'm keeping this going for shelter. There are some plants that it's just easier to cut down in the fall before they might get all matted. It may be not being used as shelter. Again, it's a complicated situation with a dynamic environment. Um, but in general, there's not anything that is particular to a xeriscape that wouldn't also apply to any garden, any perennial garden. So again, formal, lots of space. Yeah, clean it up. Otherwise, you should get to a point where it doesn't matter. Yeah. May I tag on to that just really briefly? Please do. Okay, it, you just said it, but I've been realizing recently that a lot of people think that xeriscape means fewer plants. And there's confusion about the actual planting density. And to your point, a xeriscape is going to be full of plants. It's not like you have huge breaks in between each plant where you just see the mulch, right. no matter what kind of mulch you use. And so planting density, I think, is a there's this misconception that it means far fewer plants, which is not necessarily true. Right. That is that is situational. It depends. And in places like Arizona, like if you are in Tucson planting a xeriscape, a xeriscape, then yes. Planting density becomes very important. But if you're in Colorado, you, you can look most of our, now on the Western Slope, I would put another asterisk by this. But in both, like front range of Colorado, southern, southeastern Colorado, as long as it's not an exceptional drought, the land is covered with plants, which should, it informs us that natural system, the right plants will create a full cover. And if the natural system can do it, I can do it. You're in Tucson, natural systems aren't that way. They're shrubs widely separated because they're all fighting with the water. But yes, in most of Colorado, your aim should be, I don't want to see mulch. I just want to see things. I mulch my I mulch my vegetable garden with gravel though. They're just closer. I, am, I love that. I am that. <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, gravel's pretty readily available around here. So it's, you know, you can get gravel locally sourced and yeah. at, a good, at a good cost. And and it really is a great option. I, I like gravel mulch myself. I like the product called Squeegee. It's a little bit smaller than a pea gravel, but pea yeah. gravel works great too. Yes. All right. The caveat I'll provide, I'm glad you brought up Squeegee. When you get like this with questions, the caveat I provide about Squeegee, because I... Uh, you have to be careful with squeegee and go look at the squeegee at the rock yard before you buy it. Squeegee is what gets rinsed off of all the other rock products. And so all of the other ones have sizes associated. Pea gravel being smaller, it's usually three eighths of an inch pea gravel. Squeegee is everything that went through the filter to catch the three eighths of an inch pea gravel. Depending on source of material where they were getting things, squeegee can be either mostly sand or mostly rock or somewhere in between. So go look at the product that you're going to buy squeegee because it's not regulated by size in the same way that we're going to I agree with that for sure. I don't, I don't know if we have any other questions to answer live or not. Yeah, Melissa's asking, um, is there an ethical or sustainable way to use gravel, gravel mulch? Thank you. How do you prevent it from mixing into the soil? As well? So that, that's a great two-part question, Melissa. Um, so the first one, I think, yes. There is an ethical and sustainable way compared to using other products uh, that may be on the market. And if it's part of building a bigger structure, I think that maybe the expense certainly of moving it, right, it costs fossil fuels to truck. Yes, there was a gravel mine where gravel was being harvested. Um, there is an impact. But recognizing that by our existence, um, even like trying as hard as we can to be sustainable, um, we're going to make impacts. I think the positive benefits of pea gravel towards reduction of water use um, and towards establishing these native gardens that have uh, demonstrated documented benefit for local ecology can outweigh some of the negatives. But that is, of course, a choice that you need to make for yourself um, in terms of whether or not it's sustainable enough to meet the requirements that you would like to use. Um, in terms of having it sink or mulch, uh, sink down, it's not gonna sink into the soil just you know, by gravity, like over time, it's gonna gradually sink. You can end up accidentally mixing it in or um, not accidentally, but it gets mixed in if you're gonna plant, for example, or pulling weeds over time. Yes, these are things that can happen. Again, the idea in our area though, is that you shouldn't be needing like, oh, I have to refresh the gravel mulch. Um, so the idea is to use that mulch to establish the garden, 
and to help with that rain infiltration, some amount of mixing inevitable and um, probably not that big of a deal to get your garden established and growing and, and bounteous in, in deep in the flower. Um, so yeah, it's tricky to ecology, not rocket science part of um, I But I would argue that yes, it is ethical to use the gravel um, and that don't worry too much about it sinking because you have to, you would have to deliberately really mix it in to get it mixed. So unless you're in that formal area, then you're going to be in, having to clean it, that sort of thing. Can uh, I tag on to that though? Can I tag on real quick about the depth? I was, I was just going to ask you to tag on. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, and it's not about the sustainability. I mean, I agree with you. It is um, like where materials come from, how we get them is definitely um, a valid concern. But the depth thing, a lot of people have been asking about that. And I think often what happens is people will just have a very thin layer of gravel mulch. And that will kind of settle in a little bit, but it, it appears like it's really sinking in. But if you have that thick layer of mulch, like what John was talking about, then you're not going to get that effect. But if it's just a thin layer, it does look like it's sinking. It's But it's just kind of settling in a little bit. Does that make sense? Great. Thanks, John, so much. This has been a really great class. I um, learned so much from you all the time.